First edition of the book was 2012, second edition was 2016, and the next edition is 2020. And what's changed since 2016? Mm, most everything. Uh, when we did the first edition in 2012, we said, look, the beer world has changed uh, uh, immensely since 1975, which was probably beer's low point. Then when we did the second edition in 2016, we said, it's changed a lot more. And when we do the next edition in 2020, we're going to be concluding that even compared to four years ago, uh, the way the beer scene is going is uh, just unrecognizable year on year. It's going so fast that to try and say, these are all the breweries in the world. This is what they're called. These are the best beers. You can't do that at the moment. Maybe 10 years from now you can. But at the moment, there's a rapid evolution. In many ways, it's kind of returning beer to 100 years ago uh, because before the First World War, things were, in modern terms, quite chaotic, but in, uh, in those terms, fairly organized. And I have a feeling that's where we're going to get back to, except with better kit, more beer styles, more countries joining in, and the structure of the brewing industry will be very interesting. Will that cause a bubble? Everybody talks about the proverbial bubble and boom and bust, but that's part of any industry, I guess. I think at the, at the rate of progress of the brewing industry at the moment. The fact that probably 50% of new breweries go out of business within, I don't know, five years, something like that, is not surprising um, because there's a huge amount of enthusiasm. There's not quite enough attention to technical detail in how to produce beers. There's not enough wisdom and understanding about how money works, and there's not enough wisdom and understanding about how you get your product to the market. And you have to have all three of those present in a successful brewery. But you are seeing some wonderful stories around the world of people who start off as slightly eccentric, enthusiastic nutcases, get it very quickly, then create a business that imitates what I just said. And then they go on and they get bigger and better because people like their product. And then they start to become serious businesses, and some of them are now growing to be very, very serious businesses. Um, and that's nice because it comes from people's much overused word, passion, but it comes from the fact they were a bit obsessed with beer. And the fact that they succeed in making a future for themselves, and maybe their families and all the rest of it, on beer, that's, there's something nice about that. And you talked about a bit about the craft evolution and what kind of strategies are you seeing? Are they, most of them want to get bought out and go home and... No, are, yeah. I, think, I think the reason why some, there were some very uh, well-known buyouts, that was to disrupt the market. There are some huge breweries that are very scared about what's happening right now because they all backed a very similar product in the 70s, 80s, 90s, early part of this century. Um, and that's what people are going off. They don't like industrial lagers that are produced as cheaply as humanly possible and have nothing wrong with them, but on the other hand, not a lot right with them. Um, they're wanting beers that are interesting enough, flavorsome enough to mean if there is some mild, tiny little health issue around drinking alcohol, well, it's worth it for something that tastes that good. And that's the kind of philosophy that's behind uh, a lot of the craft industry is just let's, just, let's just see what we can take things in terms of what's interesting um, and what's worth it. People are paying five times as much for a craft beer as for uh, an industrial beer. And that's unimportant, but they'll go back and do it again. And that's important because it's that much better. And do you think from the consumer's perspective, do you think consumers are going to keep wanting more, wanting people, you know, five different beers? I mean, the burnt out beer guy said uh, on his was a former brewer. He said, yeah. you know, it's all about people on apps and, you know, wanting it, a new beer and the beer brewers not having the time to perfect the beer, something that you talked about. I don't about. know if you ever interviewed Michael Kaiser, but Michael Kaiser at the moment, I, I suspect is about the most influential beer writer in the world. Um, and I, I met him in Budapest. He did a wonderful talk. And in the middle of that, he said, craft beer is a product of the internet and in particular social media. And which really got me thinking, and I think he's probably right. But it will go, it's going through a phase where everyone's new, 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 and everyone's to try every beer that comes out. That's, you're not going to base a business on supplying that. 
also these people who are so enthusiastic will get older and they'll settle down and they, what they're gonna to go to and what the businesses will go to in due course is beers that are reliable, classics of their kind, or else just something unique. And that's gonna impress your boss or impress your friends or impress anybody else who comes around that you know your beer because, oh, I buy this one and I keep this one in stock and that one. They're very different from each other, but these show that I really know beer. And because frankly, you don't know as much about beer as I do, but when I give you this beer, you're gonna go, who? Hey. Oh, yeah, good, you know, and it's been like that over the years. People do it with food at dinner parties, people do it with wine, wine snobbery. It's an established way of just showing that you know what you like. And that's where the beer geeks are going to go. They're going to become expert in spotting really good beers and the brewers that produce those are very wise. And for consumers, what do you consider the key issues for consumers in this market, is it? <laughs> over overcoming your confusion. I think, and I think that there's going to increasingly there's a desire to educate consumers. And what that really means is just say, this is how you approach understanding it. These are the beer styles there are at the moment this year. Uh, these are the ones that have kind of lasted for a time and you need to get your head around. And these are the ones that are coming through and may last, may not last. And uh, enabling people to understand what the beer styles are. Uh, how they're made, why they're different from each other, uh, which are the classics, how you spot a good one, all that sort of stuff. It just enables ordinary beer drinkers to think that they are in control of their product. They can have an opinion. It's, it's okay to say that's a good one because, and I don't like that one because it's got something wrong with it. That sort of thing. And from a consumer standpoint, I guess the voluntary labeling system put by the Brewers Forum, I never believe in voluntary systems. It's never worked. <laughs> But is that a good thing for consumers? Do you think it's something consumers I are asking I think for? it's a start, but I think, I think one of the things that brewers are very resistant to is that they don't like to put the brewery of where, where the beer is brewed and the company that brews it on the label. And people are actually quite concerned about provenance in most foodstuffs. Anything that goes in your mouth, you want to know where it came from. And that's a legitimate thing, and that's the one they're going to have to give way on because People want to know that, uh, you know, if, if, if the biggest brewer in the world suddenly starts producing some really good craft beers, they shouldn't be embarrassed by the fact because the taste will be good enough. And if it says, oh, this was actually made by so-and-so, the largest brewery in the world, actually that's going to have the effect of saying, so they, they can actually make decent beer. Uh, but at the moment, they kind of know that's not going to happen. So they're just resisting and they're trying to hide behind funny names for breweries that it's, it's actually just mega brow incorporated making another beer that's about two steps in the general direction of craft but selling it three times the price and is that uh i guess you could call them virtual gypsy brewers in a way <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really difficult when you start looking at the uh kind of ethics of a gypsy brewer and the ethics of a global brewer trying to make themselves out to be something different the the it's very difficult to try to define why it is that a brewer that doesn't have a brewery or isn't the brewery it says it is, uh, why that should uh, be such a bad thing. But I think what it comes down to is that unless they're saying, actually, we don't make this beer, these friends of ours make this beer for us, or in the case of brewers, actually, although we call ourselves this, we're actually blah, blah company. Actually, they're lying. They're lying to consumers. And if they can lie to consumers about that, what else do they lie about?